The title of this presentation is Mechanisms Based Classifications of Pain and Clinical Phenotypes. My name is Keith Smart and I'm an academic and clinical physiotherapist based at University College Dublin and St Vincent's University Hospital Dublin. I have research interests related to pain science and practice and advanced practice physiotherapy. If you have any questions or queries related to any of the content in this presentation, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me at the email address displayed. Also, I have no conflicts of interest to declare in relation to the content of this presentation. In this presentation, we'll cover definitions and some of the epidemiology of pain. We'll look at some of the prevailing models of pain, and then we'll take a more extended look at mechanisms-based classifications of pain and the signs and symptoms associated with each of these mechanisms-based classifications. And then we'll also discuss the implications of mechanisms-based classifications of pain for the assessment, treatment and prognosis of patients' pain. You know, pain is a common characteristic of illness and disease. It has been defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And this definition is interesting because it recognises pain as being an emotional as much as a sensory experience. And that can have implications for broadening our understanding and appreciation of patients' pain. Our knowledge and understanding of the neurobiology of pain continues to evolve. Currently, Neuroscience recognises pain as a multidimensional process induced and modulated by the peripheral and central nervous systems. Understanding the neurobiology of pain can be useful for us as physiotherapy clinicians and educators because it can help us to better understand clinical presentations of pain and how we might assess, treat and manage it. However, it's important to recognise that the neuroscience of pain is becoming increasingly complicated and difficult to understand. But this should not discourage our attempts to do so. We know that pain and chronic pain is a common and costly problem. Studies estimate that approximately 20 to 30% of the adult populations of Europe and the United States are affected by chronic pain. And in this case, we mean chronic pain to mean pain lasting typically three or more months in duration. We also know that pain and pain related diseases such as low back and neck pain are leading causes of disability and disease burden globally. We also know that pain problems can have a significant and at times devastating impact on individuals. We know that pain can adversely affect people's ability to undertake activities of daily living, can adversely affect their quality of life, their home and social and work lives and can cause immense personal suffering. Economically, we know that the healthcare expenditure and costs associated with lost work productivity and absenteeism and early retirement secondary to chronic pain costs economies billions across the globe. Much of our understanding of pain has been based on the biomedical model of pain which functions on the premise that all pain has a dominant tissue structural or pathological source or cause. It also assumes that pain is a simple signal of tissue injury or pathology and that pain is transmitted along a relatively hardwired neurobiological biological connection between the anatomical site of injury and pathology and the brain. It also assumes that pain is directly proportionate to any degree of tissue damage and pathology and that resolution of tissue damage or pathology should be accompanied by relief and resolution of pain. My medical model of pain conditions us as clinicians to predominantly seek to identify peripheral sources of nociception or pain, whether that be in localized tissues such as bone, spinal discs, muscles and fascia, perhaps nerve roots. But this approach can have limited value as it may not fully understand, not fully recognize and explain many clinical presentations of pain that we encounter. 
limitation of the biomedical model of pain is that it fails to explain these common variations in clinical presentations of pain that we commonly observe as clinicians. For example, pain experts refer to the puzzle of pain. And the puzzle of pain can be made up of a number of pieces. Firstly, as clinicians, we often identify pain in the absence of any clear trauma or pathology, or pain may be disproportionate to presenting trauma and pathology. We also observe that pain can persist after the resolution of any trauma or underlying pathology, and that patients report varying severities of pain in the presence of similar injuries or pathologies. We also know that pain presentations are highly discordant with imaging, and we also recognize and frequently observe that treatment patients respond differently to treatments for pain. And somewhat paradoxically, we also observe that an absence of pain in the presence of trauma and pathology. And as I say, the biomedical model of pain fails to explain this variability. Response to the limitations of the biomedical model of pain. Some have advocated mechanisms-based classifications of pain. And by this, we mean the classification of pain based on the underlying neurophysiological mechanisms responsible for its generation and or maintenance. Three main mechanisms-based classifications of pain have been described in relation to musculoskeletal presentations of pain. These are nociceptive pain, peripheral neuropathic pain, and nociplastic pain, formerly and commonly referred to as central sensitization. Whilst these three main mechanisms-based classifications are commonly discussed, it's also acknowledged that other neurobiological mechanisms are related to our autonomic nervous system function, and neuroendocrine and neuroimmune mechanisms also function in the background and in conjunction with these three main categories of mechanisms-based classifications. While these three mechanisms-based classifications of pain are often discussed in isolation, it's acknowledged that clinical presentations of pain may reflect contributions from a mix of each of these mechanisms-based classifications, such that any given clinical presentation of pain may, re may reflect a relative mix of nociceptive and neuropathic pain, perhaps in response to um, a lumbar disc herniation with with no root compression. Mechanisms-based classifications of pain are more of a clinical impression rather than a distinct clinical diagnosis. They're often used in conjunction with and to complement other more conventional pathoanatomical diagnoses. For example, a patient with a lumbar radiculopathy may be given a clinical diagnosis of an L5S1 disc herniation with S1 radiculopathy, characterized by a dominance of peripheral neuropathic pain, for example. Using a mechanisms-based classification approach has some perceived advantages. Firstly, we think that mechanisms-based classifications of pain help us appreciate the neurobiology of pain and how it may lead to variations in clinical presentations of pain. It also acknowledges that pain can be viewed as a clinical entity or a disease almost of it in and of itself. We think these mechanisms-based classifications better account for the variability, unpredictability and complexity of clinical presentations of pain, not easily explained by the biomedical model. And we also think that mechanisms-based classifications of pain can help inform how we might further assess patients' pain how we might treat it and how we might predict their future outcomes. These based classifications of pain are based on a some number of assumptions, including that clinical presentations of pain are characterized by a relative dominance of one category of pain compared to another. But as we mentioned about mixed pain states, these mechanisms based classifications can coexist and patients pain may reflect a more equal mix of these mechanisms-based classifications. It's also assumed 
that these three categories of pain may be identified and distinguished from one another based on the pattern recognition of the clusters of symptoms and signs that we can readily identify from our clinical histories and examinations. Some limitations to this mechanisms-based classification approach. Firstly, these three distinct mechanisms-based classifications are somewhat artificial. Others have criticized mechanisms-based classifications of pain as representing a more sophisticated biomedical model. And the, and the extent to which we can reliably and validly infer mechanisms-based classifications of pain from patterns of symptoms and signs has also been questioned. These limitations and, the, and their underlying assumptions Many still think and feel that mechanisms-based classifications of pain are a useful clinical approach when seeking to understand, assess and treat patients' pain. But acknowledging these limitations is important. There's an infamous quote from biostatistics that suggests that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this could readily apply to mechanisms-based classifications of pain. Take a more detailed look at these three mechanisms-based classifications of pain, beginning with nociceptive pain. Nociceptive pain has been defined as pain that arises from actual or threatened damage to non-neural tissue and is due to the activation of nociceptors. So a relative dominance of nociceptive pain is attributable to a relative dominance of activation of nociceptors in peripheral somatic or visceral tissues. And it's this category of mechanisms that most closely reflects the previous biomedical model of pain and that pain is assumed to arise from the activation of nociceptors in peripheral bodily tissues. And so clinical presentations of pain considered to reflect a relative dominance of nociceptive pain are those pain conditions assumed to be predominantly driven by the activation of peripheral nociceptive sensory fibers. It refers to and may be triggered by injury or pathology in somatic or visceral tissues. But no, the category of nociceptive pain does not reflect one single mechanism. It may reflect a range of neurobiological mechanisms, including the activation of peripheral nociceptive receptors in response to noxious chemical inflammatory stimulation or from mechanical or thermal stimuli. Classical examples of clinical conditions considered to reflect a relative dominance of nociceptive pain are discogenic low back pain, which may arise from mechanical or inflammatory triggers, fractures and osteoarthritis. Relative dominance of nociceptive pain may be identifiable from a range of clinical indicators, themselves identified from our clinical interviews and clinical examinations. For example, a clear proportionate mechanical anatomical nature to aggravating and easing factors is one such clinical indicator. Others include pain that is localized to an area of injury or dysfunctional pathology, and pain that usually and rapidly resolves or resolves in accordance with expected tissue healing and pathology recovery times. Identifying a relative dominance of nociceptive pain may inform our treatment approaches. For example, as clinicians, we may use advice and education with our patients. We may advise them about physical activity and exercise. We might advise them about the use of non-steroidal or analgesic medications. And we may advise them regarding the use of electrophysical agents, such as the use of cryotherapy or thermotherapies. We may also prescribe exercise rehabilitation and exercise programs for our patients. And we may also use manual therapies. Perhaps in certain cases or where previous treatments have not helped our patients, we may refer patients on 
to other disciplines, perhaps for consideration of corticosteroid injections, which are a potent anti-inflammatory. And these would target the, the nociceptive inflammatory triggers of pain. We may also refer our patients on to interventional pain physicians for consideration of interventional pain procedures. Or in some cases, we may re refer or recommend patients for surgery, such as total knee arthroplasty, which essentially is designed to remove the peripheral pain generator of the patient's pain. On now and consider peripheral neuropathic pain. Peripheral neuropathic pain was defined back in the 90s as pain initiated or caused by a primary lesion or dysfunction in the peripheral nervous system. This older definition includes reference to dysfunction in our peripheral nervous systems. A more recent definition of peripheral neuropathic pain excludes the word dysfunction and defines neuropathic pain as pain arising as a direct consequence of a lesion or disease affecting the peripheral somatosensory system. With nociceptive pain, peripheral neuropathic pain is not a single mechanism. It can arise from a range of neurobiological mechanisms, such as from the activation or sensitization of connective tissue nociceptors. It may also arise as a result of the formation of ectopic action potential generators at sites of nerve injury. Neuropathic pain can also be mediated by cross excitation between neurons and exonal sprouting, both in the peripheral and central nervous systems. And peripheral neuropathic pain may further be triggered and modulated via various neuroimmune interactions, such as the activation of glia or neurogenic inflammation. Examples of clinical presentations of pain that we may judge to be characterized by a relative dominance of peripheral neuropathic pain are lumbar or cervical radiculopathies involving nerve in root impingement or compression secondary to disc protrusions or facet joint spondylosis, for example. It's been estimated that approximately 20 to 35 percent of clinical presentations of low back pain may reflect at least some degree of peripheral neuropathic pain mechanisms. Also, it's been estimated that approximately 23% of presentations of osteoarthritic hip and knee pain may also, refer some, may also reflect some degree of peripheral neuropathic pain. When we compare peripheral neuropathic pain to non-neuropathic pain, and, by, from, and from that we infer nociceptive pain, studies show that patients characterized by a relative dominance of peripheral neuropathic pain tend to report pain of greater severity, greater levels of anxiety, depression, and poorer health-related quality of life, as well as greater levels of functional disability and incur greater healthcare-related costs. Issues of increased pain, pain severity, anxiety and depression, and greater levels of functional disability are important to acknowledge and recognize. As we know from the low back pain literature, that these features may contribute to poorer outcomes and a poorer prognosis. And as such, they're important for us to be aware of. Identification of peripheral neuropathic pain clinically may also be identified based on the pattern recognition of clusters of symptoms and signs. Identifying neuropathic pain clinically can also be augmented through the use of neuropathic specific screening instruments. And clinical impressions of neuropathic pain can also be supported by radiological imaging, such as MRI scans or neurophysiological tests, such as nerve conduction studies or quantitative sensory testing. A number of clinical indicators of peripheral neuropathic pain have been described. These include pain variously described as burning, shooting, or electric shock-like. Clinical impressions of neuropathic pain are often based on a history of nerve injury, pathology, or mechanical compromise. And we also 
we identify neuropathic pain when it occurs in association with other neurological symptoms such as pins and needles or numbness or weakness. Another prominent characteristic indicator of neuropathic pain is pain that's referred in a dermatomal or cutaneous distribution. And there are a range of other potential clinical indicators of neuropathic pain. The presence of neuropathic pain may also be inferred from clinical examination tests, such as the presence of mitomal weakness or pain provocation tests that target neurological tissues, such as the straight leg rays for the sciatic nerve and lower lumbar nerve roots. A range of neuropathic pain screening tools have been developed and are used by some in clinical practice. They are not necessarily diagnostic of neuropathic pain and should only really be used in conjunction with a clinical examination and history. There are a number of neuropathic screening instruments available. Some are based purely on patient self-report measures and others include a, a small clinical examination component. A systematic review of the measurement properties of these neuropathic screening instruments from 2015 suggests that they should be used with some degree of caution as they do have some limited measurement properties that may affect the reliability and validity with which we can infer neuropathic pain. Clinical algorithm to assist clinicians in identifying peripheral neuropathic pain has also been described. A patient presenting with pain and with a history of relevant neurological lesion or disease or pain that's distributed in a neuroanatomically plausible fashion is deemed as being possible neuropathic pain. And then on clinical examination, pain in association with other sensory signs, again in a neuroanatomically plausible distribution, may then be considered probable neuropathic pain. And having a diagnostic test that confirms a specific lesion or disease in the somatosensory nervous system that explains the pain enhances the likelihood of neuropathic pain. It's then determined, determined to be definite neuropathic pain. Identifying peripheral neuropathic pain may inform our treatment approaches. For example, Again, we may use advice or education to advise patients about relative rest or physical activity. We may advise them to see their GP or family doctor or another medical specialist for consideration of pharmacological management of neuropathic pain. Various classes of antidepressants have been shown to be somewhat useful for ameliorating pain of neuropathic origin. As physiotherapists, we may use exercise rehabilitation to try and improve the health or mobility of the nervous system to help desensitize it. And we may use manual therapy procedures for similar reasons. We may consider referring patients on to other healthcare professionals for consideration of nerve root blocks, for certain clinical presentations of radiculopathy, for example. Or we may refer patients on to a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic specialist for a surgical opinion regarding spinal decompression. Alternatively, we may refer patients on to pain medical specialists for interventional pain procedures, or we may recommend that patients attend be assessed for their suitability for multidisciplinary pain management programs. Finally, let's take a look at nociplastic pain. Plastic pain has been defined as pain that arises from altered nociception, despite no clear evidence of actual or threatened tissue damage causing the activation of peripheral nociceptors or evidence for disease or lesion of the somatosensory system causing the pain. To some extent, it's a mechanisms-based classification by exclusion, where there's no clear evidence for a nociceptive or peripheral neuropathic dominance of pain. Patient's pain may be inferred as being attributable to a relative dominance of nociplastic pain. Nociceptive and neuropathic pain Nociplastic pain is not a single mechanism, but a range of potential neurobiological mechanisms. These may include or reflect 
the amplification of neural signaling within the central nervous system that elicits pain hypersensitivity. It may involve enhanced synaptic excitability, lowered thresholds of activation and expansion of receptive fields of central nervous, central nervous system neurons that process nociceptive inputs. It may also reflect a loss of spinal cord inhibitory interneurons, or it may reflect enhanced facilitatory or loss of inhibitory descending pain control mechanisms. It may also reflect facilitatory cognitive and affective mechanisms, as we know that patients' thoughts and feelings can powerfully modulate patients' experiences of pain. It may also reflect altered cortical processing of nociceptive inputs. Clinical presentations that are thought to reflect a relative dominance of nociplastic pain mechanisms are presentations of fibromyalgia or chronic widespread pain, and some clinical presentations of chronic low back pain, whiplash associated disorder, osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Epidemiological data on nociplastic pain specifically is not widely available. But in lieu of this, the prevalence of chronic widespread pain, which is assumed to reflect a relative dominance of nociplastic pain, has been estimated to have a population prevalence of 8 to 11 percent, and fibromyalgia, a population prevalence of 2 to 4 percent. It's also been estimated that approximately 10 percent of cases of chronic low back pain presentations may reflect some degree, if not dominance, of nociplastic pain. Again, Looking at the impact of nociplastic pain, limited studies show that patients with nociplastic pain tend to report pain that's of greater severity, greater levels of anxiety and depression, poorer health related quality of life and greater levels of functional disability compared to those with nociceptive and peripheral neuropathic pain states. And as we mentioned previously, acknowledging these potential psychosocial factors is important as they represent what the low back pain literature describes as yellow flags or predictors of poorer outcomes. Emerging evidence and opinion suggests that central sensitization or nociplastic pain may contribute to a range of clinical presentations of pain, some of which we've mentioned, such as fibromyalgia or chronic low back pain. Also, there's some evidence to suggest that shoulder impingement syndromes or migraines or visceral pain problems such as chronic pancreatitis may reflect some degree of nociplastic pain. These causes of nociplastic pain are not currently known. Predisposing factors may include a positive family history of pain, which may reflect some degree of genetic contribution or predisposition but they also reflect learned behaviours. There may be some psychological attributes that may predispose some people to developing nociplastic pain. Negative thoughts and emotions that predate pain may be contributory. Triggers of nociplastic pain may reflect various psychosocial stretches such as workplace or family conflicts. Limit, there is some limit, limited evidence to suggest that gastrointestinal infections may be a possible trigger. And in the presence of underlying inflammatory rheumatic disease, approximately 25% of these patients will develop some degree of comorbid fibromyalgia-ness or by, and by extension, a degree of nociplastic pain. Potential clinical indicators of nociplastic pain include the presence of diffuse, widespread pain rather than local pain or pain in a neuroanatomically plausible, plausible distribution. Presentations of nociplastic pain may be accompanied by other somatic symptoms such as fatigue, and memory loss and issues with concentration and sleep disturbances. Nociplastic pain can often have a more unpredictable, inconsistent presentation in response to aggravating and easing factors. And any pain elicited in response to mechanical testing may be disproportionate. Patients may also describe the history 
of variable or suboptimal responses to previous treatments. As with peripheral neuropathic pain, there's a clinical algorithm to assist clinicians to identify their relative likelihood of underlying nociplastic pain. In this clinical algorithm, nociplastic pain is considered as being possible if conditions one and four are met. That is, if pain is chronic, lasting greater than three months, and more regional rather than localized in its distribution. And if it occurs together with evoked pain hypersensitivity phenomena, such as static mechanical allodynia testing. Nociplastic pain, pain, pain is considered probable if the patient's history suggests the presence of pain hypersensitivity, such as hypersensitivity to touch or pressure or movement. And if there's a presence of comorbidities, such as sleep disturbances, fatigue or cognitive problems. There is a screening instrument available for clinicians to use, again, to help inform their clinical reasoning as to the likelihood of dominant nociplastic contributions to a given patient's pain presentation. The central sensitization inventory is a 25 item patient self-report questionnaire, which is freely available and readily scored. And a score of 40 or more out of 100 is considered to reflect significant nociplastic pain. Clinicians can use the central sensitization inventory to supplement their own clinical histories and examinations. My nociplastic pain can in turn inform physiotherapy treatment decision making. It may inform the extent to which or how we prescribe exercise therapy and rehabilitation or how we utilize principles of graded activity. It may influence our education strategies. It may involve us explaining pain to patients, reassuring them, or explaining patients how to pace activities. And it may include specific pain neuroscience education. It may reflect or invite us to consider therapies such as cognitive functional therapy, which has been employed for use in chronic low back pain. It may justify the use of manual therapy, perhaps as a desensitization tool. And it may invite consideration of electrophysical agents such as transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS. Patients presenting with a relative dominance of nociplastic pain may be suitable candidates for referral on to a pain management program. And newer developments and research studies investigating the effectiveness of virtual reality interventions may provide future treatments that can assist with treating nociplastic pain. There are some expert derived guidelines that recommend multimodal interventions for patients with a relative dominance of nociplastic pain. These include various non-pharmacological treatments, including psychological therapies. And it also includes the use of pharmacological agents, such as centrally acting analgesics. In summary, we recognize that pain is highly complex, but that classifying pain according to the predominant mechanisms responsible for its generation or maintenance may be useful for clinicians in helping to improve our understanding and inform our clinical decision making related to the assessment, treatment and prognosis of patients' pain. We welcome any observation or comments regarding the content of this presentation. And please do feel free to contact me with any comments or queries you might have. Thank you very much for listening.